going to give a moment for everyone to connect their audio. But it's wonderful to see you all. Thank you for joining us. And welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 571st New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, the Programs Assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Vincent Katz, Sarah Sarhandi, Rachel Levitsky, Laurie Luxemburg, and Bill Banks Jones on the occasion of the opera Where There's Light. And we're thrilled to welcome poet Valerie Schoen here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter. And the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that here in New York, we are on Manape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Manape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat in a moment for a living document of resources and actions. Today's conversation will be recorded as always and uploaded to our YouTube channel where you can see the full archive of the new social environment series. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Rachel Levitsky is a founder of Belladonna Collaborative. She is a professor of writing at Pratt Institute, Naropa University, and occasionally for Poets House and the Poetry Project. British mezzo-soprano and director Lori Luxemburg specializes in contemporary music and has performed widely in opera, concert repertory, and musical theater, working with many leading composers. Vincent Katz is a poet, translator, and hybrid form prose writer. He is the author of multiple poetry collections, most recently Broadway for Paul, published in 2020. Sarah Sarhandi is a composer and virtuoso violist with joint British and Pakistani heritage. She is particularly interested in and recognized for her collaborative work. And British opera director Bill Banks Jones is an art is the artistic director and founder of Tete a Tete. He is best known for his work in new opera, having directed over a hundred world premieres. Uh, we're so lucky to have these amazing guests with us here today. And I will now pass the mic over to Bill. Thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And um, what an honour and privilege to be talking to you. I am here in West Cornwall in the southwest of England, Hotfoot, from a rehearsal of a new opera. Um, and uh, Vincent asked me to just say a few words about the context of our work and Tete Tete, my company, and how that helped give birth to Weather's Light. Um, I am a director. And after a certain amount of time in big opera companies, I felt that there was a whole lot of work that I wanted to do that I wasn't able to do within those structures, um, particularly around inclusion, around experimentation and around form and size, really, that um, new operas in the UK tended to be absolutely enormous things written by extremely famous people who'd never been to the theatre. And I derived uh, English National Opera, particularly as a theatre director who'd been putting on a lot of plays. And I was fairly appalled, really, at the theatrical illiteracy of people making this music um, in these very high stakes, very public productions. It's something that carries on to this day. But I felt really strongly that we needed a fringe. So I made one. Um, and in the naive hope that this would form the much needed bot bottom of a pyramid that would lead to a um, more uh, better informed large scale work. What actually happened is in a way better is that an absolutely thriving fringe exploded in the UK. We started doing short new operas and Port Mountains, very playing with the form in all kinds of ways. It could be two minutes or uh, longer, whatever. Um, it was an absolutely magical time. Um, but what, what I found is that having made a place to direct shows, I then started letting other people into that. Um, felt like there was this sort of civic duty to give back some of the help I'd had forming a company. And what we've found now is 
there are just hundreds and hundreds of people with brilliant ideas wanting to take the potential of opera and fly with it and not create incarcerated in the very kind of museum like structures of traditional opera houses but just to go bananas and do whatever they want to do um and since then we've done well we've got at least 600 new operas videoed on our website if you want to go and watch any of those and among those uh well there's light which was a very special piece that we had last year i mean one more foot well two more footnotes to add to this actually are i'm talking as if i invented the fringe and actually we went a bit more international over the last few years most of the people in our festival in the uk aren't from london at all um and i started going to more conferences i've got a family in america of new opera makers with opera america um and also in Rotterdam, in Vienna, in Barcelona, we're finding that there are these tete -tet like festivals all over the place. And it's not at all that I made anything happen, but I'm part of a dialectic that has fed a wonderful new creativity of innovative approaches to work. And um, the other footnote to add, because I think it is important context for this piece, is tete -tet was at the forefront the very forefront of reopening opera after covid in the uk so we began with a pilot um, for our government's department of culture media and sport for the reopening of live performance in july 2020 we did a full festival of live performances 18 different shows in september while everyone else was still closed um really through obstinacy more than anything else and uh, the following year which others may talk about a bit the 2021 festival where vincent and sarah's work was presented um it was still people coming into the theater from isolation and the most touching but also challenging situation where it, it, it was thrilling for people to get back onto stages and also you had to keep remembering something that was also needed extra care really um, from all of us from audiences and artists alike and among those shows was Vincent and Sarah's piece and I think I should hand over to Vincent your VJ on you to, to let us have a look at um, exactly what we're talking about uh, yes, thank you, Bill, for that intro. It's really so informative to hear of these um, trends and developments in opera. And I, I know of a number of uh, contemporary poets, colleagues who are trying opera experiments, um, you know, trying to work with opera. It's, it just seems like such a daunting task uh, when you're <laughs> when you haven't done one before. Like, how does one do an opera? Um, I just actually saw Philip Glass's Akhenaten at the Met and it was so spectacular and, it, and, and a really different form for an opera. And I feel like um, I'd like to, you know, bring Sarah in right away because this is a collaboration and the collaboration came about, I think, primarily because, or one root of it was the idea of working with ancient ideas in very contemporary forms. Um, so that's something that's been important to me. It's why I chose to translate this poet, Sextus Propertius, on whose poetry the libretto is based. Um, because when I first read him, it was just like this electric voltage went through me of, you know, I know this person, was, he could be down the block. He seemed so contemporary. Um, and likewise, when I heard Sarah's music, I could hear a lot of um, different elements in her background. Her she's classically trained, but she I'll let her talk about this. But she kind of fled that environment. She found it too restrictive, not unlike what Bill was talking about. And um, you know, and then there's her Pakistani heritage, which she also brings in. Um, but I think I just want to end this intro by saying, when I hear her music, I hear that same thing that I found in Propertius's poetry or that I tried to bring to my translations, which is something very ancient and contemporary at the same time. So Sarah, I don't know if you would 
like to say a few words about maybe how we began this collaboration, just the initial, because um, you were the one who had the idea. Yeah, I um, well, I, I'd read a few of Vincent's poems. Uh, a mutual friend gave me, um, Celia, called Celia Littleton, gave, gave me a pamphlet of his poems and uh, I, I loved them. And then she said he was doing reading in, uh, I think it was in the Horse Hospital in London, which is this old horse hospital. And, um, and uh, so I went along and I just literally started to, I, I mean, I'd been working in recording studios, you know, uh, with other people helping me, but I just got my own studio together and I learned was learning Logic Pro and learning to, work with sound which which I've always been fascinated with just pure sound um but I I once I got to be able to actually get my hands on it as it were myself it opened up in a completely uh, new I don't know new but it just opened up this whole world for me and um so I I just started that and I think I just made a piece for a, a dance uh, company and we'd won a, a, a big award in, in, in England and in Canada. Uh, and I saw, and I just went to hear, and that was just recording the sound of voices whispering. Uh, and I, then I, I, I just saw Vincent read these poems and I just felt completely in love with them. So I begged him, could he, Mm -hmm. I was very nervous to ask him, would he possibly allow me to try to set something to music? And I think I related really strongly to his, to his, the way he writes, or no, they weren't actually, well, it was a translation, but also in his own poetry, uh, this feeling of classicism, but complete modernity at the same time, completely here and now. So you can be in ancient Rome, you know, 2000 years back but you also feel that you were in New York and and this beautiful beautiful American English which I just loved so that's hmm. kind of how it started I just started playing with them Vincent I think oh well, thank you for that I'm glad that you asked me <laughs> um, <laughs> and when I heard the music I was I was just kind of blown away because you never know what something is gonna be, somebody says, you know, let's try something and sometimes it doesn't work out. But that, this music, I, I listen to a lot of all kinds of music, uh, classical, contemporary, and um, this just seemed to really fit. So why don't we actually play the first, we have some video clips from the performance that we did last summer at the Tete a Tete Festival. We did several pieces from this opera that is still in progress. Um, so the first one we have is called Venice, uh, which is an instrumental piece, and so um, these are short clips, but Sarah, I was wondering if you have anything to say to, um, to introduce this piece about the music. Yes, um, well, this piece uh, is something I actually put together for um, uh, for, for um, for, for a film, it started with it anyway. I took a motif, I took some of it from something I'd made for a film about the painter Anthony Malinowski. And it, it was uh, it was about Venice and it was sh shot, it was about him going to Venice from Poland and how his world opened up and and the light and the, and just the feeling of light and optimism and and uh, lyricism and mystery and it seemed to really suit, uh, you know, the, the feeling for beginning this opera uh, okay. from the start. Well, why don't we... Setting a scene, as it were. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to hear, I think your compositional practice is so interesting and you combine um, electronic music with, um, you know, classical instruments and recorded and live, but why don't we hear this, let's watch this clip and then maybe, you know, we can talk about it some more and maybe, you know, Laurie will wanna jump in too on the conversation and Bill, Rachel.
So that's an excerpt, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know if anyone, I've been talking a lot. I know Rachel, Lori, do you have anything you'd like to ask or comment or Phil? I mean, I can comment certainly, um, but I don't know. It's not. Um, I'm not. I'm not a great intellect. Just to just to <laughs> let you all know. Um, so number one, um, it brings back such great memories, you know, mm. because um, and in fact, I have a memory of uh, Sarah putting that fabulous dress on, and then um, tottering out in these fabulous heels and going, oh, I can't really walk in these, but they look great. I'm like, oh, just doesn't matter. Just kind of, you know, put them on the stage and walk to them, and then put them on, you know. And um, it was just, it was such a great uh, atmosphere. And uh, two of my favorite musicians, Sarah, I think you sound absolutely gorgeous in that clip. Well, you sound gorgeous anyway. Mark Sanders, the drummer, mwah, like absolutely one of the most brilliant, sensitive percussionists on the scene today, I think. Um, but, but I think also, um, what I really loved about it was of, of Sarah's presence, because although you you know you composed it, blah blah blah, but also um, that you're there as a character. So you're kind of um, you've written it, but you're kind of like a, you know, you're you're this you're this instrumental character that's very that really kind of binds everything together. Because we, you know, it was really kind of um, I don't know much about ancient Greek drama, but from what I understand, um, we came on as characters and we we did our thing as it felt like being in a Greek tragedy the way the way the way we did it, um, or or indeed a comedy. Um, so so the style of it because by necessity because we we didn't have massive amounts of time to rehearse, so the staging was was very simple, um, and and so there, there's a kind of a there was a kind of formality about it that I really liked, but in particular that clip really highlights Sarah's role as this kind of instrumental actor, uh, which I think is very nice. Yeah, but mainly it brings back this boof, this memory, that, that fantastic music, you know, it's so cool. Huh. And also because it's COVID, it was COVID, it was horrible. Like, yeah. you know, it was all this bullshit COVID stuff. And then this thing was happening, which was just like live music. Oh. You know, we hadn't done live music for none of us were in a, in a in a room with another musician, like actually a live one. We were doing zooms a lot, but you know, so it was really quite special as an event. Yeah, yeah that's I love that idea of an instrumental character because that's exactly what Sarah was. She was such an important part of that performance, not just orally, but you know, visually and in her presence. Um, so one thing in that clip that you could hear is that there was recorded music and live performed music and also improvisation. I mean, Mark is famous for being an improviser, the percussionist. Um, so Sarah, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about improvisation in your practice, in your composing practice, maybe in, in performance. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you, Laurie, for your glowing <laughs> oh. report and words it was a truly fabulous well it was I mean I was there I was leading but I was also I mean I could it, it was a team that was so important and you you know Laurie and 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 Mark and and Bill and Vincent and the whole uh you know Eve who was our other uh the male singer um Eve Oak and um, Rosie Middleton, it was just teamwork all the time. And especially working with, um, and this isn't so much about the music, but working with Bill and Tete -a Tete was unbelievably brilliant because we'd go to these Zooms every week and I was actually shielding during COVID. And so I was completely isolated from human contact, but these Zooms through that sort of few months in the build-up there was a real feeling of community so I, I really thank you for the compliments but it was just such a for me it was a team that did it as that's, far that's, that's, that's um, very, it's very cool I mean I just just to cut in there a moment because um Bill although uh, uh describing tete, -tete sort of in its technical terms and uh, of course the creation of this operatic fringe which didn't really exist before you galvanized it with the flying fox i think at battersea art center 
uh, uh, all those years ago. Um, but you can't actually, it's very difficult to describe the atmosphere of the festival. It's really very special and it's like, um, you know, there's loads of productions happening and it's, there's a real kind of buzz about the place. It's, uh, and that's very hard to describe and it's, it's really, it's great if you're an audienza kind of thing, but it's super great if you're in it. It's like, it's really fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted. I'm now going yeah. to... No, you're right. Well, I think, why don't we... Um, uh, I, I have one little thought just to, just to share maybe quickly. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, I just, I, I, every time I see it, I'm really so struck um, by the play of light and dark in the, in, the, in the staging. It's so simple and yet it's so brilliant the way that Mark looks like he's a screen, like flickering, maybe like a ghost and like, you know, like the memory of the day as it fades and that Sarah's wearing this sort of like beautiful frock that's like pajama-like and it's it's like dark, but there's suggestion of light. So I just want to note that as well. I really I think that. in the music, thanks Rachel. That's so interesting that you know that you pick up on this. And also I think in, in the work itself, there's a for me in the music, there's a lot about dark and light. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a there's a lot yeah. about dark and light. Um and in that piece, I just wanted to just talk for a minute about the the, the, the my improvisational process, which uh, also that piece, I multi-layered the viola. So there were multi-layered recorded parts, but there was also, I was playing added layers on top of it and improvising. And that was kind of quite, quite a nice way of going into the performance. I really liked it. Um, and I, 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 I studied classically uh, like Laurie, like, <laughs> you know, uh, st studied as a classical from from when I was five or something, you know, uh, and went to the Royal Academy of Music. But then I got pulled out of there when I was still a student to go and play with this avant-garde group called Rip, Rig and Panic. And um, I recorded in, I, I went to the recording sessions and there were people like recording the sound of a vacuum cleaner and stuff. And I was just, it blew my mind. And, I was, like, I was just playing Brahms and Mozart, which I loved all these things, but I love Bach. But I'd never seen anyone record a Hoover, you know, a, a vacuum cleaner. And then, uh, so they took me and they, I was still a student and they took me to uh, Munich and they threw me on a stage in front of 3000 people. And they said, we got this trumpet player and he's called Don Cherry and you've just got to play with him for three minutes. <laughs> I didn't pick up on my viola. And so that was my introduction really to improvising. I was just thrown on a stage in front of 3000 people with Don Cherry, who basically invented, you know, pra pra you know, one of the original inventors of jazz music. So I couldn't have had a more wonderful introduction to the concept of improvising. And I, I think I've, since then I've, worked with other obviously improvisers and I've woven this into my practice. I think, and the, I think the two feed into each other, my classical uh, base, base, also this improviser, they're interchangeable and they interweave and that's very much part of my process. I think another uh, great poet that Vincent and I know that also sings, Julie Patton also improvises with Don Cherry. Thank you. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, he was amazing and he was so stylish. Mm -hmm. he, I just never forget the first time I met him, he had a suit on and a hat and he took his hat and he bowed and he said, hello lady. And I just nearly fell over. I never <laughs> met anyone like that. And then when he played, it was just like so free and so beautiful. And never too many notes and, you know, wonderful. Well, um, Rachel, I, I also appreciated your comment um, because as, although as Laurie noted, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to work on, on staging or resources. We did put thought into it. And one of the ideas was to have Mark all dressed in white, you know, because usually like if the, the fallback is like, oh, just wear all black. If you don't want to think about what you're going to wear on stage, a musician. And I said, no, no, wear all white. That'll be more, um, 
kind of like the mood that we're trying to get into here. Like this is, although there's a lot of um, tragedy in this poetry, it's not, it's not about depression at all. It's about this kind of life giving force. Um, it's wildly ethereal too. Like it, it goes way beyond the choice of white. It's something else is happening in that frame, in the, in the video frame, it sort of really takes advantage of the screen, you know, the, yeah. Why don't we hear the next, uh, see the next clip because we'll get into the, uh, you know, the poetry and the libretto combining with the music now and um, they'll give us more to talk about. Lucky me, radiant night and you come. So I, I, I realize I should have set that up a little bit, but I can just say now that, um, so the main uh, subjects, characters in this opera are Propertius himself, Sextus Propertius, um, who writes very much in a first person um, mode, which is also very contemporary. Um, and many of his poems are about his lover, Cynthia, um, and they're, love affair, which is kind of tortured and frenetic and full of breakups and crazy meetings and jealousy. Um, but also beautiful moments such as she is recounting in this aria, and that was Rosie Middleton, a great mezzo soprano who we were fortunate to have with us. Um, I was wondering if I could ask Rachel to maybe comment on that Aria, you sent me some really interesting um, notes in an email, and uh, and I just when I was, I guess I was emailing you. I thought I always think of the Lou Reed line that I think is so classic in, in his song "Some Kinds of Love." The line is, "No kinds of love are better than others," and I feel like the challenges of their love affair are kind of like the substance of this poetry, but I don't know. Would you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I've, <laughs> it's so rich, I have tons of thoughts, but the one I'm having right now is how much, um, how much the, the, the work, the, the opera and the poetry together really evoke this sense of holding on to the moment of lovemaking, but not, but as you say in your introduction so brilliantly, um, that night kind of uh, is a cipher for all connection and all this sort of pleasure and this sort of stolen away period where the world can, where the, where the intrusions that would interrupt lovemaking and the pleasure and connection are, um, a, at bay. Um, so that was sort of like the, that was what I felt in this piece right now, just listening to it again. It's just this, um, the capturing of night. And, and uh, as I said to you earlier, I, I'm, I'm dark and there's so many other things that are going on in terms of, you know, uh, uh, you know, facing off with the pressures of writing epic poetry and the pressures of, singing songs of praise to Augustus and being an epic, uh, being a state poet and, and um, versus, you know, being in the background and write, writing love poetry, like the, all those things are happening, but, but, but the, but the, the toric that I see Propertius is doing is, is actually promoting the intensity of this 
holding on, you know, feeling of dread, not dread, but of, of, of wanting to hold this love against the state, against the day, et cetera. That's great. That's yeah, no, that's thought. really um, well put. And 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 you're you're alluding to something we haven't had a chance to mention yet, which is that um, Propertius was living under the empire of you know, Augustus was the emperor, so it was like this very large militaristic state, and he was actually in that inner circle. He had the same literary patron as Virgil and Horace did, and like them, he was at certain points expected to write poetry in praise of the empire and of military values. And he has these two great poems of refusal where he, he says, I'm, I'm not able to do that because um, my kind of warfare is writhing on a narrow couch with my lover. <laughs> he uses this, there, there is very interesting rhetorical devices that come throughout uh, classical poetry that he adapts and changes. Um, but Bill, I feel like I've been co-opting your role as host here, and you—you you were there. You gave us oh, yeah. certain okay. advice. So, what do you? What does this bring back to you? Seeing this, clip? I'm stepping firmly onto my back foot because you're all running yourselves so beautifully. But um, the the things that really struck me watching both those clips is the same as all of us who were there. This very happy memory of kind of blossoming and freedom it looks so sparse because everything was socially distanced the performers were apart and the audience was apart and they couldn't be in the front row because there were too many people but somehow that sort of incarceration gave the whole piece an absolute blossoming and i think a lot of that was to do with your your words and and your music sarah and particularly the the fact that you were improvising gave it this just whew, kind of freshness and relaxation the other thing that is um i mean it, it's apparent already and a very vivid memory um is the frankness about eroticism just stops you in your track so yes there's this political context for the text but also um he's talking about sex or love making or whatever you want to call it in a way that we wouldn't have been able to you know in the 40 years ago when it was all samantha from bewitched or whatever and there just wasn't any sex and it just wasn't like that at all it's amazing how he's talking in a way that is almost freer than one is still able to now i, mean, I don't know if you sensed that vincent is is that the thing that sizzled through you when you read it um well i i agree with you and i, and I feel like the era that we have lived through like the 1960s 70s um we, yeah, it felt like, well, we're getting back to some kind of um, liberation, at least in certain areas of life. Um, not all, of course, uh, that, yeah, that, that existed uh, millennia ago. And, you know, ancient Greece was even more so in certain ways. Um, with, you know, valor, uh, homosexual love was considered the, the um, higher form of love. And heterosexual love was something that, else but um so yeah i don't know Rachel, I, say, yeah, I mean I, I i think bill's 100 percent right that even today it's actually i mean i don't i mean you make a good point vincent in your introduction of saying like he was propitious was actually going beyond what poets were doing so who knows what it was like to write about sex like this at the time and what kind of risks that really like what what he was really risking but i do think i'm trying to write actually an essay about the through line of sex in two um, writers' work, Gail Scott and Akila Oliver. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of terrified to do it because there's so much risk involved in, act in actually talking about sex in, the, in these times. It's really a fraught, fraught um, space. And I think there's tons of self-censorship. So I think Bill is absolutely right. I think so like sex as something that actually is a part of the content of the poetry that's talked about is really rare right now. Yeah, it, there's another thing going on here as well. I mean, it's so boring to keep going on about COVID, which I keep doing. But actually, when you made this performance, it was in a time when 
free intimacy, if you like, was was forbidden. That you know, it was there was a different mitigation on the transactions of sex, and I, it's not to say that the piece is always going to be marvelous, whether that's there or not. But it sort of came at that moment, didn't it? And that that added to the intensity and power of it in the space. I'm, I'm dying to see another bit now. Is it too cheeky to say, quick, hit the play button, let, what, what have you got next? Yeah, let's let's do it. So this is, again, going to be um, Cynthia, um, but it's a different part, and this is the part where it becomes more elegiac and um, putting into context, in the context of, you know, mortality, what the struggles of... Uh, of love and passion they face. thing that strikes me seeing that again is just beautiful but it's it was when you were there a very very live experience and Sarah you made it sound as if the room was absolutely packed full of musicians and there were just three of you how how, how did you do that I can't I, you've already described it and I still don't understand it was miraculous well, as I say, I think I just, uh, you know, just got into sound when I was making this work. And so I just added, I was like sprinkling things in. <laughs> uh, I recorded with that pizzicato uh, in, uh, I went to Penzance to visit an artist friend of mine and I just scribbled something down on some paper and I came back and I recorded it. And it was kind of in a little box, you know. <laughs> then when I had to do this aria, I got it out of the box because I thought it would be a good starting point. I wrote the melody, I added violas, I added... I think it's not, there's not that much there. There's, a, there, there's uh, maybe there's like um, sampled sound of 
something. You, you <laughs> certainly know. don't need any more. And and when you use it, quite fast you... actually. But there's a good. They're, they're nice effects on the on the on the um, on those pizzicato strings, which add depth to them and that sort of slightly shimmery quality that it has. Uh, and were you using a loop? Were you not in that piece, the first one you showed us, were you playing with an echo of yourself? Was it a looping? Were the other parts recorded? So there were other har harmonic, harmony, harmonic parts against my part. I think also I'm slightly influenced when I was thinking about that first piece by Sufi music and the way that it becomes sort of transcendent. And so there's, uh, there's something of that in, in the way I put together this version of Venice. I, I like this, I like to go to the sort of out there, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, what would you say, transcend, tran transcend, or trance-like almost in some ways. And did... I aim for a big sound. Yeah, Even, you said... Uh, I mean, a, a sound that has breath even though there may be a few elements in it. I'm very interested in space. I'm very interested in the space between notes, between sounds. I think a lot about the space as, uh, as well as the actual sounds and notes. So I think it's that spatial awareness. That's why I like to work with dance, with contemporary dance. I'm very interested in, I sort of almost imagine what else is going on other than the music that makes yeah, well, sense yeah I, well i was going to say the 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 it's it somehow very tied in with the words it doesn't feel like you just got some words and set them to music and you did a song da -da 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 -da. no it's very very involved in those words and in fact in the meaning of the words uh, even just now when I was hearing it, it really brings tears to my eyes. So those words, they strike me very strongly. <laughs> uh, well, I want to say the the end, see, there's a different uh, harmony in the last, in the concluding couplet, like you, the music changes there and the lines, you know, perhaps tomorrow shuts in our fate. It, and yeah. I heard the word fate is the, yes, it's it, the harmony changes. Uh, and it's really haunting. I've told you this, I, when we were rehearsing, I would wake up <laughs> in the gets night, haunted, you wake that, up. <laughs> that phrase, it, I mean, just, you know, it enters into your head. And um, it, it just, it, again, like your music, um, I feel like really complements and, and gives life to the poetry because the, the poem, you know, started out with a sort of, um, you know, in praise of sex and this memory of this great sex, but then it kind of, by the end, it's this other thing. And you, you, you just kind I of- I think also the word fate, tomorrow shuts in our fate. And, the, and mm -hmm. I've said this to you before, Vincent, that word fate and the T on the end of it, it's like a door slamming. That's yeah. how I heard it. Fate is like, that can put an end to the, you know, to lovers being together, or you never know what's going to happen next. <laughs> Sarah, maybe you I, want to introduce. Oh, Rachel, go ahead. I have a question. Um, this might be a good time for it because, right? So there's so much about um, the morning being like this terror, like the, the terror of the morning, mm. and yet there's also all this. You know, they're in Venice, and there's and there's this also this sort of hope about that light, the word light actually represents. So I was just wondering, Vincent, and the rest of you about in choosing your title while there's light, which sort of like almost is like a terror of like there not being light. It's a, about the play of, uh, it's almost like not anxiety, the feeling is not anxiety, but maybe a little bit of a, like a slight dread about these transitions. And I was sort of wondering about if you had any comments about that. Well, to me, I, I always like to try to find a title that's simple, you know, like these simple words and just kind of can stand there and hopefully have multiple meanings. And in fact, you, as you and I were talking earlier and you had a different and really interesting interpretation of that phrase than what was mainly in my mind, which 
was about mortality, like while there's life, basically, like while while we're still alive, and that like light in that sense, you know, if light is life and darkness is death, um, consciousness closing and ending, um, while there's light. But I just found it a very subtle and interesting way that Propertius has of expressing this idea that is familiar to us from poetry. And, you know, Carpe Diem is the most famous one from Latin poetry. And I like Horace a lot, but that is in a, almost in a way too much of a, an ad. It's almost like a sound bite and too kind of clumsy in a way. But, but whereas Propertius is, is always in this murky, I think that's maybe what you're getting at too, this sort of, um, well, it's a demi-monde for one thing, but also like it's in an area, and you use the word transition, like between um, night and day and between this and that. And in, in our email correspondence, you use the word fluidity. Um, and I don't know if you wanna talk about that now or bring that in later, but the, in terms of their relationship. Um, it's not, it's not one, it's definitely not one defined thing. Well, <laughs> one of the things that I notice is, right, that, um, that Cynthia is really kind of the top of, of the story, right? Mm -hmm. And he, but also that Propitious's character and Propitious in the, in, the, in the arc of what he's doing is also kind of topping from the bottom. Mm -hmm. Right, like that. He that on one hand, he's like, you know, I'm subject to you. He gives her the narration for what for what for the agency of sex, right? That those first couple of the second and third clips that we saw. That's Cynthia speaking, um, yeah. singing. <laughs> and um, so there's that fluidity also in terms of identity and like you know identifying. I, I, I noted too that he that the, it reminds me of Cynthia and Propitious in this remind me of um, Warren Beatty and Julie Christie and McCabe and Mrs. Miller, where mm. you know it's Warren Beatty's character is you know afraid to speak just to like to to, to 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 come out and say what he wants from Julie Christie. He's wondering if he's a poet, you know, and. Mm. And she's she's like waiting for him to get with it, you yeah. know. And you know, so even though they're a heterosexual couple, they kind of are trans in so socially in terms of what they do. And I kind of had that feeling as well in these in these poems. Um, but what was I going to say? Uh, there's one more thing I was going to say. Anyway, yeah, I, I do think there is a kind of top oh that he's topping from the bottom also because he actually ultimately he wants to be this great poet mm -hmm. right and he and he is using these vehicles of um you know sort of a kind of humility or a bottom to say like actually i'm this great love poet finally and the, my poetry is going to be heard all through all through rome so well, another part of this cool. this genre that he wrote in uh, called latin love elegy where they, they were these roles and the role of the of the po of the poet who's the man usually in most cases was the term miser like he was miserable and he he suffered and and the his lover was the was a domina she was the like the, the mistress but also like the the master in a way and she yeah she called all the shots and there's a, there's a you know one of the rhetorical devices is the poet sleeping outside the gates all night long again like in the night waiting for the morning as you're saying when maybe a messenger will come out and he can get into her abode um we have a the next clip is another instrumental one sarah i was wondering if you might want to introduce this one it's the one called frustrate yes this this piece um is another piece that i i um brought to this work it was a piece i i ma made and modified over quite a long time um it's really a piece about being angry about the iraq war in the beginning um i was walking down uh westbourne grove which is a road in london that i love and it was the day that my country in invaded uh well, I think in America also, <laughs> invaded Iraq and uh, it was very quiet and there's these beautiful white stucco fronted buildings and I was just 
so upset and angry just thinking you know this is no sign of the destruction that's that's now occurring in Iraq and uh uh, so I started to make a piece and um, and it's just about being frustrated and angry about war. Um, yeah, it, that, that was kind of how it how it started. And then uh, I just want to also say, because I can see him here, that um, Mark Sanders, the percussionist who worked with us, brought such a massive amount to the music um, and particularly uh, you know, he, he uh, added layers and more depth to the work that uh, that I couldn't have even thought of. So I'm really grateful to him and thank you, Mark. <laughs> The other thing I wove into that was was um, was was voices from two people. One was an, uh, a friend of mine who is an ex-Israeli soldier, and he uh, he he left a message on my answer phone because I asked him to with the words um, what it means to be human. And the other person was an Arab peacemaker who is also a friend of mine. Uh, he left the same words in Arabic, and they're kind of in there somewhere. There's so much in it all, isn't there? It's, um, yeah, tantalising. I'm wondering whether we should have another clip, because we've got three more to get through, haven't we, and probably want to take some questions from the floor. Um, yeah. Because it's so rich, each time you put something on, there's so much to take in and think about. It's because you put so much in. Is it the moment, Vincent, do you think? I think that's a good call. And so now we're going to switch to Propertius himself. And this is, um, this Aria is, a, he's talking about a little bit about his background. And um, and part of that had to do with, he was from Umbria near Perugia, which they called Perusia in that day. And um, in 41 BC, uh, Octavian, who was later to become Augustus, besieged Perusia, and then after that there was land reappropriation. And from some references in Propertius's poems, um, you know, they lost property, but also lives you know, in his family. Um, so he talks about that in this aria, and then I think we're also going to hear the bit where um, now maybe that's another clip. Sorry, I think this one is just about the the um, the land. This was especially painful for me, my Etruscan soil. You allowed my relatives limbs to go abandoned you cover the poor man's bones with no Oh. Uh. 
of this reduces us to silence each time we have a clip, doesn't it? <laughs> um, that's another one with found sound, right, Sarah? That was very um, important to that piece. Yeah, so the, the, the found sound there was, uh, was again, uh, actually it was, um, I was just having dinner and I left my Facebook feed on, uh, on some random Facebook, like person who I didn't know, who was recording the sound of bomb bombs dropping in real time live in Gaza. They put a microphone on their windowsill, and um, I just realised when I ca came into the room what was going on, and it was chilling because it was it was going on in real time, and I was hearing it, and I just realised it was an incredible sound uh, i wanted to document it so i just switched my microphone on i was lucky it was in the room uh in my studio and uh yeah i recorded it and then when when i had to so you hear dogs barking you hear you hear bombs dropping you hear drones you hear the sound of war you hear the sound of modern war and 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 propertius is talking about the massacring of uh, etruscans so, and I just had this in my box when I started. So I, I remembered and I, I thought it was, so, so I wrote the melody against that sound. And it just fit perfectly. It's incredible. So we haven't heard from Laurie in a bit. Maybe we should actually literally hear from her in this next clip where she's singing the words of the god Apollo. And in this case, it's um, a poem in which uh, Propertius is imagining Apollo speaking to Octavian before the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, in which he's going to defeat Mark Antony and Cleopatra and then take power ultimately. Um, so yeah, she compares, or Apollo compares, him to Hector, more famous than Hector, conquer the sea, the earth is already yours, and continues from there. Let's hear that one. This is Laurie as Apollo. Um, what have I done? I've lost everyone. We've still got you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't <laughs> see any of you. Yeah, yeah, we still have you. Uh, each time you play a clip, it's like a completely new show. It's it's amazing because, of course, when you see it in the theatre, you just got it all together all at once, and now leavening it, leavening it with these conversations in between changes it hugely it's extraordinary how, how how different each sounds and how different the mood is of each um a thing i'm quite curious about is you were it it's right isn't it sarah you set translations that vincent had already made but on the other hand you two worked together a lot to make this happen didn't you it'd be interesting to know a little bit about what that process actually was well, we did, yeah. I, for one thing, had to transform po poems into a libretto. So, actually, that um, that aria that Cynthia sings 
is in the original poem spoken by Propertius himself. He's the one who's remembering this night of lovemaking. But I made it that she was remembering it. So that's one thing. Um, and the same here, I guess this is Apollo speaking to Octavian, but it's sort of extracted from a longer poem, which is a, is a narrative. So yeah, there's some of that process to make it you know, more dramatic, dramatic, have a dramatic um, quality to it. And then sometimes I think I would say to you, Vincent, I, there are too many words and I have to have a few less. Totally, yeah. No, um, we'd have to, you know, go back and forth a bit, didn't we? Even though you'd made, you know, you were, you'd made these excerpts, uh, you turned it into a libretto, as you say, but there was still, I, sometimes I found I needed something else or, no, you're totally, you're totally right. And we, we both um, worked to do that. And it's when I look at, you know, what is the, the libretto now, it's almost like a snippet of the poem, but it's kind of like the right snippet. It's like focusing in and honing. And, and we even, I mean, I have to say, I even would change the translation slightly and not very much, but every once in a while, I just change it just so it phrased better for singing. You know, it became a different, vehicle for the poetry. And that's one of the things that fascinates me about this whole process. And Bill and Lori and Rachel, you are involved with this too, is like how poetry or text um, functions in different ways at, at different times. You know, there's reading something in a book is one experience. Uh, hearing a poetry reading is another experience. And then combining it with music is always, I find, you know, a dangerous proposition. Like it can, <laughs> it can fail utterly <laughs> easily. So there's a lot. Yeah, I mean, the collaborative process is. I could fail also to set it. <laughs> the, 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 the this, uh, in this in these in this opera is just astounding. I just want to like I'm so honored to be here and to so glad to get to immerse myself in this work. It's so, um, yeah, it's it's. And it's immersive, but also it's so cohesive. Like Bill had talked about this, but there's just a sense of you all really working in unison, not exactly as a chorus, because it's all because it's clear, there's clearly poetry and there's clearly percussion and there's clearly singing and there's clearly staging and costuming and you know it's really good tech, but um, it's so um, in unison. It's in, it's unified in a way that I that, it, that succeeds absolutely for me. Is that our moment to see our last clip, do you think? I just want to hear, we're still on Apollo. I'd really like to hear okay. a bit from Laurie about, um, you know, how how was your process working on, on, like, how is it to learn this music and how difficult is it, how easy? I don't know, like, I don't, I don't really know much about, just you, when I heard you do it, you were already kind of doing it in this amazing, August <laughs> Apollonian way. Um, I'm just so curious how, you know, what you get, like what Sarah sends you and what you work on and how you learn it and perfect it. Yeah, there were, I mean, there were challenges with this because um, there was a um, sitar line in the track that I just cannot <laughs> Here it was like, Can you hear it. I know. I had, so to, I had to be in sync with this, this sitar and I'm like, but what, the thing is, when you sing, uh, your head is it, a quite bizarre sonic experience um, that your your perception of sound and your own voice actually is like. Well, you, you probably know that, but so that was a that was a challenge um, of of learning it. But the um, the music is incredibly lyrical and um, vocal. I mean, it's very um, it's written really uh, well for the voices for, for voices. It's very it, it sort of sits very nicely and, and there's something about um you know when you get a, a score from someone or it doesn't even have to be like a score that's completely on paper or whatever it just can be arrive in any form you like but it, it's sort of like an invitation as a performer to step into a world and step into a character so try on the subjectivity of the composer librettist and you can like really step into this thing and it's sometimes such fun you know because i mean and also um with this particular 
role or, or I, it's quite nice to be a bloke but in a kind of a but but not sort of dressing up in sort of whatever but just as me but representing that particular energy um it was really good fun um yeah uh it's kind of uh to perform like that um in a piece like that it's really immersive because you 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 kind of um what's the word um you you sort of absorb it and then and then you do it sort of thing that's it bam and uh and it's it's great if you get if you get like a world like that to be in it's so great and like uh also like the track was great but um and uh mark like so so because that's how that's kind of unfurling as you're doing it so mm. so every rehearsal is a discovery on some level of, of a different aspect of of performance of 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 the, of the piece and, and how to do it. I feel so honoured working with you, Laurie, because uh, every time I've worked with you, I, I've always felt that you've completely absorbed the music I've given you and I just completely trust you and let you go and do it. I never have a... Thank you. That's nice. Thank yeah. you, so. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, it's not, it's just... um it's very special it's kind of a it's really it's quite profound uh thing to do um and it's it, it it's just it's just this sense of complete absorption and I, I suppose like when like in um when you're in a rehearsal with like in the rehearsal so sometimes there'd be p p points where it would be going really well you'd be going oh my god this is going well i'm in sync with the sitar and everything's kind of grooving on up nicely and Mark's there kind of like being fabulous and everything's fabulous and then I make a mistake and it's like oh shit and it sort of breaks it you know it's so annoying when, when that happened <laughs> um but when you're when you're sort of performing and there's just no uh you're sort of in the moment and it and you, that's kind of like a sense of if the score is fabulous and the words are, are fabulous and like everything's um the setup is cool, cool and groovy, and then it's really great because then you, you know even if something doesn't go quite according to plan, it sort of does. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, because there's room for that. I think. Yeah. Uh, that there, there should be. You know, that the, the mistakes become part of the performance. It's like or or happenings, like when. I, I did I, I made a collaboration with Pakistan's most legendary guitarist in Karachi and tried to bring um, I, I mean I brought brought a performance which Laurie was part of and Mark and Vincent uh, to the South Bank in in London and Amr didn't get his visa uh, which was oh, yeah. terrible very very yeah. sad and um, yeah. we were waiting like to, up to really sort of 16 hours before just hoping he was going to get his visa hoping 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 uh and he didn't come through till two weeks after the performance uh he was in pakistan in karachi but we we made it do you remember we all said we've got to make this this absence part of the performance there's nothing else we can do if we sit there making a hole where he should be and not being able to think of it as like he's not here, okay, he's not here, we're gonna make that, we're all gonna feel that and make that part of this experience. That being said, that whole situation was so unbelievably shite. I, I remember it really well. And um, you crap. on the phone, <laughs> and then, then there was a moment where you kind of went, all right, all right we have to just, we just have to do this. But when um, was it? Was it recent or? It was in 2016. Right. And that year, like, Two thirds of the Pakistani artists that tried to, you know, that were that were booked to come, and sponsored by the South Bank, they just didn't let them through. Uh, it was very peculiar, and even they had a letter from the Pakistan High Commission saying, "Please, this is what this is one of this is practically our most iconic artist. Let him through." It was terrible, but anyway, these are the joys of international working, which don't show up on Zoom. <laughs> That's why the pandemic. 
We have, huh? we, I think we need to get to our last clip because we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, and this is, so this is Propertius again, and it's the one called the Roman Callimachus. Um, and it's, it's his kind of, something we alluded to earlier that um, Rachel was talking about, about his, Propertius's poetic ambitions and his desire to be known as a great poet and remembered as a great poet. And he, he admired this Hellenistic poet, Callimachus, who lived in the second, third century BC, who was kind of reacting against epic poetry. And he had this famous slogan, which was a big book is a big piece of crap. And he wanted to write, you know, smaller, very erudite, learned texts. And so Propertius and, and all his contemporaries, honestly, um, were in tune with this. And I just, in the music again, there's a musical shift when he, um, in the lines where he talks about, um, to me, Bacchus, extend your leaves of ivory, that Umbria swelling with my books be proud, Umbria land of the Roman Callimachus. Extend your leaves of ivy That Umbria Swelling with my books be proud Umbria Land of the Roman Calimic Whoever sees these citadels ascend from the valleys will value their walls by my genius. Can I say one little thing when we're accolade? Yes. Again, these, these small decisions that you all made that, or they appear small, I don't really know, like how, are so genius, but to have Propitious wear a suit without a shirt is so absolutely perfect. Like the dressed, undressed, the like sexuality that's suggested, but also cloaked. It's just beautiful and perfect. And it does so much. Thank you. Thank you for, uh... Bringing, you know, noticing that and bringing it into the conversation. Yeah, thank you. We were lucky, we were lent a very nice suit by a tailor in London called John Pierce. So, I don't know, do we have any questions from the audience? Is that time for that? Yeah, um, thank you so much everyone for your amazing conversation. And those were really incredible clips. Um, so thank you for sharing those. Um, we do have a couple questions from the audience. Our, our first one will be from our friend GE. Um, GE, you should be able to unmute if you wanna ask your question. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Thank you everyone for this, this glorious production. Um, question, it might be a little more of a, of a kind of inside music geek question, but <laughs> once, when I was stumped on a libretto I was writing, and I was trying to get more feeling into it. Um, I went to a mentor composer, David Diamond, the late, great David Diamond, and he told me to just be generous with your spirit, and the libretto will be a reflection of your spirit and, and your belief in life. Is there anything to this in the way uh, that you shaped your libretto, Vincent? Um. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Could you? Oh yeah, I, just the idea of you know getting um getting you know um a sense of um um being generous with your own personal spirit, 
um, and 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 allowing that to then just reflect through with your own with your own personal beliefs and everything. In other words, and helping to mix that in with your channeling of of Propitius. Okay, I see. Yeah, no, it's inter- that's an interesting question. I I feel like, um, you know. <laughs> I'm maybe getting to that point now. I feel like translation, you know, first of all, because it started as a translation project, and I, I love that word translation, which is related to transition, which we were talking about earlier, because I, I feel like everything we do is translation, honestly, you know, in the same way that everything is a Freudian slip. But um, so I, I feel like in my translation process, I was not giving myself a lot of freedom. In other words, I wanted to be as rigorous as possible and I wanted to respect and represent what Propertius wrote as clearly as possible. However, he gave himself a lot of liberty. He was this kind of crazy writer who who busted syntax and you know meter. He worked in a in a meter, but it was he was always fooling around with it and changing it and and transgressing. So he was yeah very transgressive poet. So I think the generosity he he allowed himself a lot of generosity. And then I was trying to like respectfully um, be as, you know, as accurate as possible as I could in the translation. Um, but the generosity I think comes from the collaborative process with Sarah because she, you know, becomes very generous in the way that she can talk about her music and, you know, we have many conversations and we'll make suggestions to each other. And, and there, I think there's a real generosity that I, I couldn't have um, worked with many other people as fluidly. Thank you, Vincent. I feel the same and you're always very generous and uh, you, uh, you, you've illuminated me uh, as far as words and the use of words and the use of language. Um, I feel really privileged. Thank you. Thank you. Any other Thank questions? you. Thank you for that question, GE. Um, our next question will be from Raven. Raven, oh. go for it. Hello. Okay. Yeah. So um, my question is, um, in, in comparison to Sextus's life, in ancient Rome under the Emperor Augustus to our ten- contemporary moment. Um, I'm interested in knowing uh, what struck you, Vincent, about the connections to this comparison or differences. Connections to the present, you mean, or? Yeah, um, yeah when comparing Sextus's life in ancient Rome under the Emperor Augustus to the contemporary moment, to now. Okay, well, the first thing I, felt when I first read his poetry, which um, was quite some time ago, was I felt a connection to him as a, as a lover, you know, as a, that I, I related to his relationship to Cynthia. Like that was something that um, I felt connected to. Then as I got more deeply into his poetry, I, he, <laughs> he went to places that I said, well, I, I don't really go there. I'm not gonna go there. Like he's, he's very into this. Um, I guess bottom <laughs> situation you could call it, uh, or the misere, you know, the the, and and actually claims a certain power from that. He says, "Not light is the medicine in my words, because suffering has has given me my expertise." Um, so there's kind of a double edged sword there too. Um, but I think maybe you're asking more about the political situation, and I and and again, I mean, this is not news, but you know, empire is like empire. And, and I feel like, you know, we live in times that are, you know, different, of course, technologically and in scale, but in a lot of ways, similar to uh, the times of the Roman Empire, which was basically a dictatorship. Um, Augustus was the, you know, called himself the princeps or, you know, the first one among the senatorial class, but basically, he would say like, don't you think we should do such and such? And then they would all say, yeah, I think we should do such and such. You know, so it was, it was just, it was <laughs> uh, a democracy in 
name perhaps, but not in fact. And then there's, you know, there's a, a great poem by Propertius where he, he kind of allows other people, his friends who are, you know, adhere to these military values. And then there's one poem where he describes a, um, a triumphal procession in Rome and he goes to see it with his girlfriend and uh, describes what's going by. And then he says, you know, that's all great for you, but for me, it'll be enough to sit with my girlfriend and applaud on the Via Sacra. So he's um, in that world. He's a little bit apathetic. Um, he just kind of wants to do his own thing. But yeah, I, there's definitely a overarching similarity in the context, I feel. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Raven. Um, thank you, Vincent. Um, our final question will be from our very own Fong. Um, Fong, go ahead. Oh, I think you're muted, Fong. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Vincent. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Laurie. It's, uh, I'm down with COVID oh. a day and a half or two now, but it's like a cold. I sweat a little here and there, but this is really healed me. It's just terrific. Thank you, Rachel. Also, your reference to Mrs. Miller and Mrs. McCabe is quite brilliant. And I, my question is very simple because I, appreciate the word kept emerging, which is fluidity. It's a, the word itself, I don't remember exactly, but definitely it's about the ability of a, of a substance that can move and flow so easily between things from one place to another. So you talk about translation, um, Vincent, early on. So the question is very simple. I think that with Sarah confessed that she trusts her faith and everyone seemed to follow that calling, the inner calling. And it's not that they're similar to Vincent having written the, the very important volume on Black Mountain College, the history of it, which is very influential to how the rail was created from the very beginning in 2000, in October 2000, where really trying to bring, unify the community together to collaborate. So I think the collaboration is so essential. All of you came together as I'm now halfway through a book that I enjoyed reading very much by a former diplomat, now scholar teaching at Yale, named Charles Hill, it's called Grand Strategy. It's about literature, statecraft, and war order. It's really about how everything connects to everything else. You know, why the world has become more complex, very, very immersive. We can't no longer afford to think about tiny little problem here and there in our little insular orbit. It's really how to mobilize the practical experience in field with wisdom from a broader and deeper knowledge of history, literature, philosophy, everything else that is now so badly needed for a statement of diplomat, people in politics to understand, although the books intend for that kind of readership, you know? It's still very interesting because for me, when you, your translation, obviously proficient is really about everything I'll describe, right, Vincent? Mm -hmm. uh, Love, lust, obsession, hatred, mistrust, death, and everything else, human virtue really is everything. So only when we connect everything, embrace everything, uh, and be honest with ourselves that we can be fluid. And I think that's why in those translation is important, it's so urgently important. Um, so my question to you all is that, how did it how did it initiate it and how did it shape and how soon did you all come together in other words how did you first meet and then came together so fast i mean i i think the whole thing should be staged once again when things are better in new york city i think we should do it at ben 
I think we should do something as grand as that. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it reminds me so much of uh, I Stay on the Beach, mm -hmm. you know? Wow. Um, so I think it can be staged in a very monumental, yet very minimal, because it's intended to be minimal. Um, so I just want to share that, that sentiment with you all. I, I love the vibrato. I love the rhythm. I love the singing. I love the whole thing. I, I really, I felt moved by it. It's so healing to me. So again, my question is that how did you first met and how soon did it take shape with the whole opera? Go, maybe we'll begin with you, Vincent, of course. Yeah, well, we, um... Sarah talked a little bit about this before, about how the project kind of got off the ground. But we met before that. We met in Edinburgh uh, at one of the theater festivals where Sarah was working on a piece. And um, we had some haggis in a parking lot with some friends. <laughs> and um, it was a memorable trip. And then, um, yeah, we as Sarah said earlier, she heard me read and I read, I found, actually had my set list from that reading remarkably. So I know exactly which poems I read, including some translations of, of Propertius. And I think those were the ones that really got to her. And, um, but just to answer your question, and from my point of view, is like- What year was that, Vincent? What year roughly was that? Uh, it was more than 10 years ago. It was like about- oh. Okay. Years ago, yeah. But that's what I meant because you know I was curious about the day. Yeah, it's I mean we were younger then. Okay. <laughs> we were older then. We're so much younger than that now. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> but um, but but you know this thing about quickness is a, is a really good question because it does feel like it's happening quickly, even though it felt at times it was happening very slowly, right, Sarah, or not happening at all, and we would. Um, we always wanted to do it. It was kind of always um, a passion and it, we were inspired to work on it, but other things get in the way, you know, and other projects and uh, you need you need support really to work on an opera. That's what we're learning and we're trying to get to that stage. I think when it this began time. to snowball was when, when, uh, when we met with Bill. Exactly. Um, I was introduced to Bill. I mean, uh, so I've, Laurie and I had worked together before, uh, Mark, the percussionist, uh, before the other two singers, not before this. But I think um, it was kind of slowly fizzling along, you know, this idea of the opera. And then I I got an arts council, an English arts council grant in the pandemic. And I just decided to do a series of podcasts uh, just conversations with people I, I'd worked with because uh, I was completely alone in my flat in lockdown. And um, um, one of the conversations was with Vincent. I said to Vincent, let's have a talk about the opera. And then it sort of just I thought, well, why don't we do something? <laughs> uh, you know, and then um, I was introduced to Bill and then we seemed to get along and then Bill was very generous and and said come and do something at the festival so then then it all started to feel like it was all moving quite quickly in this peculiar space where there was nothing else happening you know there was just a, a, a vacuum of lockdown and uh, and it was really lovely uh to 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 have this now it feels like let's get on <laughs> that's how i feel like let's get on let's go for it now i'd love to come and play in new york even if we just brought this sh this pared down show and another, you know, another couple of pieces or something, but I would, I'm I'm dying to come to New York and play, so and um, bring this music and, yeah, I think Vincent's exactly right. You know, it's a lot of support needed to bring something like this to. Why, well, my Bill? How did you think about that? Because. The way that Sarah say that she's not as intellectually inclined or equipped, the way she talk about her work as an artist remind me so much of how Francis Bacon talk about his own work as a painter. 
It's exactly the same rhythm, the same honesty. I'm so, you know, so touched by it, really. What do you think about that, Bill, when you and Sarah sort of became friend and collaborator? Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it's funny to look back on it all because it, it, it was such a human time and in, in some ways so banal that we would, as Sarah said, meet in a big group of lots of artists uh, coming together to make work and actually talk about some quite banal things sometimes, like <laughs> how much we charge for a ticket or is everybody okay or can we make our work really sustainable? So it's, it's, that's my my memory is this togetherness really of, of a very large group um but my memory i guess of sarah and vincent working together really shines out of the work is this a meticulousness and thoughtfulness and great loving care with which everything was done um that uh, that every gesture and every moment was put together so thoughtfully and sings out of the work. Yeah, so true. And I'd just like to, to add, um, echoing Sarah, that um, being allowed to be part of a tete-a-tete -tete was fundamental. It was just a very nurturing experience. Uh, leading up to the festival itself, there were weekly Zoom meetings, which at first I was, skeptical i said well, why do we have to have weekly zoom meetings you know and you'd be kind of put on the spot sometimes but after a while i got to really love them and realize how how fundamental they were to creating this openness you know people sharing about what they were working on which people are often reluctant to do and then getting support from the tete -a tete team and then finally being able to work there it was just you know thank you to tete -a tete really Great pleasure. I I think what was so pleasing about that, and that the more severe the pandemic, the more powerful this was, was artists supporting each other. It wasn't just like there's some clever person looking after lots of inadequate people. It was a huge creative team making a vast number of shows and together and helping each other and fixing each other's problems. It was really magical and. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I'm suddenly laughing because I'm remembering absolutely everybody who did no work in the pandemic getting lots of awards and us getting none at all. And I think that's rather marvellous because we were actually there just to make art and not to compete. Um, and maybe that's threatening to everybody else, though, if you, you're there to support each other rather than to um, be better than everyone else. No, it's not that at all, Bill, as uh, War Whitman in his democratic vista warned us that it is our job, our duty to work, to collaborate, to bring culture and make it available to everyone, not just for the cultural elites. So this is our moment. This is where the function of artists, our job is so important. We, we have to bring it outside the academy, which is very important, something that we should talk, continue talking. Uh, the rail is committed doing that. So anyway, I shall we continue? This is the beginning. I love to be able to find ways that we can collaborate as our big show is going to be 10 plus venues. The first three open the last few days, few evenings. It's called Singing in Unison. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, monumental. I think it's going to be amazing if we somehow can find a way to include the opera in it also. And then working towards BAM one day. <laughs> let's, let's see we can do that urgently. So anyway, I thank you. I'm grateful to you all again. Vincent, Bill, Sarah, thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Rachel. Back to you, Eleanor. Thank you so much, Fong. Um, thank you for closing out our Q&A. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Valerie Schoen, to the stage. 
born in the year of the earth snake and raised by Chinese Taiwanese Amer um, immigrants in Cincinnati, Ohio. Valerie Schoen is a poet and interdisciplinary artist and the author of several poetry and hybrid collections, including To Love an Artist, which is forthcoming from Essay Press, which and was selected by Renee Gladman for the Essay Press Book Prize and, and Outside Voices, Please, from CSU Press. Um, her work has been supported by Foundation for Contemporary Arts, Pen America, Lighthouse Works, and public streets and trails she has walked on and hummed along for years. Thank you for joining us, Valerie, and I'm so excited to turn, you, turn the mic to you. Thank you so much, Eleanor, and thank you today to Vincent and, and everyone for presenting really transportive work and sharing about your process. Um, I, I'm really buoyant to be here, and I also appreciate the invocation of Mrs. Miller, Constance Miller is a perennial muse for me in, in my cosmography. So I really appreciate that. Um, today I'm going to read from a longer work that um, is, it's difficult to extract from it, but if there's one sort of overarching question I think that is always on my mind as I'm working on it is as, as post-future subjects, as people who are sort of occupying this time segment, which I feel is an ending and a beginning, how much must we give up to enter a new being, a new sort of being with each other? How much, what is really being asked of us materially to be given up in order to commit to what we say we're committed to? Um, so this is from that work. If you knew that you could exceed what is due by compromising a little, by forfeiting one obliqueness for another, that is the obliqueness of searching for the obliqueness of having found, would you? Would you answer, it's not that I was not enough for it, but it was not enough for me, but I was not enough for it because it was not enough for me. In between the obliqueness of searching, there is the obliqueness of missing the obliqueness of having found, though this present obliqueness is a searching one. Then is it only here that could prevent turning this searching into a having found? And then is it here only that any transfer of here into a there and there would turn back the clock? Inconclusive, but it will give us a glimpse of what could be ours. We build houses for people. We are not brave because we do this. What is the opposite of X-ray vision? I think I have it. Perhaps in going ahead, we wish something irrevocable might happen, though we know it won't. And what is irrevocable cannot happen. It was already there before either of us left, before the irrevocable could happen, even if it could. Like two blocks of stone with faces carved into them facing each other, mere inches away from each other. Could we tell the hero the hero got it wrong? Could we avoid a handling of this by bluntly mishandling it? When the hero has to get it wrong and we're the medium, do we become more immortal? That's one way. Where did you get your teeth from? From my hands, from the shape I make when the others are praying. If I can see past the mounds and the forklifts and just be on my way, which is around the maze, am I foolhardy? What disappointment did I anticipate by avoiding telling her there's no street, there's no address, there's no ordinary courier system, the disappointment of a reality of whisking away? We're not known as primates in either case. I have often felt assured, self-assured, varicose, and that there were some scenes I could have documented, perforce not so calculated, but pure, and I assured myself or preemptively made the omission, not because I felt there were a surplus or something of those scenes, among all scenes, but because I forget sometimes that's all I need. We might as well have over-prepared for the drive, for we heard tales of winding roads, steep drops, hands clutching to the sides of tiny cars, but it was not the road that left us in awe. These were incorrect descriptions of a road. We were not driving into the heart of a mountain. We were going on the edge of it, inclined. 
One after the other, are we to soldier on? Can we receive a rush? Is there a chance for us to respond? What we are tipped over into the place where dignity is at stake. And what's that something fused with acceptance? Is that how spree goes? So can spree ever be walked back? Once we are tipped into spree, how could we have gotten something so simple, so wrong? Because how to know the watermark would disqualify? No, the mislabeling would disqualify? Who knew sharing this tipping point would bring us more risk, could even tip us back? Once I am unfettered, I will cease to have the urge to take out the trash, my trash may even immediately diminish by half. Once I am unfettered, how will I be used? How will I let myself be used out of a bargain of using? I used to think that because I heard fully what my mother said and felt fully what my mother said about her mother and her mother's mother, that she heard fully what her mother told her and felt it fully. And that what my grandmother remembered is something I know. What about the ones of us that don't long for a jar of good soil from a friend? Once I see this pendulum of violence turned outward, I know then that our peace can only come in my forfeiting all that awakened my senses in the first place. I have to, in fact, betray the very knowledge that got me here. I have to be that tarnished it. What if we came to recede? What if we came to recede? Whether you're bundled up in one bag or lying super on a raft, on the ground, on a tatami mat. The sense of total hurtling will always be a supine hurtling. And the sense of impalement will always be non-total, incomplete, incumbered. The third generation's breasts, since they could actually be called such, were swollen and looked almost human, human to the extent that I've seen. We should take into consideration how the beasts fed their young, how much of a chance they had for survival. I could call to them from a mile away, though I have the gene that prevents people from whistling. I would mock whistle. That would hurdle, set into a hurdling without supine, a complete hurdling. And they would electrocute themselves again and again to be reached. It is not a person. I am not in search of a person in the quiet. The doors are closed, the curtains drawn, but it is not a person. What do two people on the front stairs of a building know of the quietness of where they are right now? Will one of two people make it home tonight? Am I imagining their workforce, the workforce of two people? This workforce has made them family. She sent me a note a few summers ago so they bought a house near the city we first met in, and it's the city she's from. One reason to stay near her tribe, too, because old love is dying, like the coasts. Do I feel empathy for myself? No, it's much worse than that. Did the strandedness disarm our standstill, or is it what makes the standstill more lethal? Imagining the world shining down on us, imagining what that does to us, what that has to do to us, small contribution. If I woke up today with swollen hands, has the tide changed? If I woke up today with dirt beneath every other finger or something like dirt, will the tides go back to normal? There is a membrane, a membrane phobic to water that is keeping your lips together. The membrane can't migrate anywhere else barricade. Every time the reset passes us, who we are to each other falters. Someone sitting on the edge of a roof can see straight in. What will happen if we do not recede, if we decide to lay our heads on each other's shoulders, show up on the other side of town? We never went off the gold standard. Our currency can never go off the gold standard because when I almost shared the circle with you, all I felt was blame alone. I saw you seeing me with nothing. Did my stare mean nothing to you? All this time, I was the one with short-term memory. And in sharing this, my failings would be held to me. We are talking about five different apologies, but I'm forgetting whether it matters how fastened in I am on the edge of the circle. Is the edge of the circle the opening or the suction point? Is the edge of the circle where it begins to malfunction? As one level drops, another surges. As another experiences a minor peak, my full force was my own surge. Could I have damaged the system further? How are the scientists 
able to isolate each line? How are the scientists able to stay within the very thin layer? Tell me telepathy is not real. The city's being released today. The city's yell today becomes less abashed. People will pay for this, will pay less attention because of the weather's distraction, because they are late for playtime. So I owe it again to the mouth, the throat, the tongue, and how these sounds have evolved and how a sound carries its own notations without our input. A pure sound wants to be read a certain way to all those who emerge out of one hole in the ground. And of course, another way, but the same other way to all those who emerge from another one hole in the ground. When the sound of my people's names used to feel like needles entering me, when the sound of my people's names made my skin crawl, it was because of geography. As one mound flattens, another emerges. What did we have in common? If what we sustain each other with is what we do not have in common, and if in each other's naked presence we never have to worry about shock or hypnosis, if we never have to worry about one of us jumping into the valley of the other person off the mountain of ourselves, what does the elevation and flatness and stasis say about our mutual sustenance? I am in the apartment alone today because it's Tuesday. When I go to the grocery store, I've been living wrong. Thank you. Thank you so, so. There we go. <laughs> thank you so much, Valerie. That was really incredible. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for being here. And thank you again to Vincent, Sarah, Rachel, Lori, and Bill for your amazing conversation today and all of your work leading up to today. Um, so grateful for this afternoon. So thank you all. And over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our public events, just like right here in our daily NSC. Um, please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers and editors and operations here at The Rail. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for our 88th Radical Poetry Reading with Mariam Yvette Karsikar, featuring um, poetry read by Lupe Mendez, J.D. Fugger, Aliyah Lavone, and Irene um, Vasquez. And you can now turn your mics on and say hello and goodbye. I'll see you, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you, guys. So much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Bravi. Thank you all so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.